Ten Commandments. Number two, Exodus 20, 4 to 6. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of any that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. This second commandment concerns the way, not the object of worship. It commands, number two, Israel not to worship or serve images in the worship of himself. Now, we mentioned in this first commandment that clearly God alone is the object of worship. There are no other gods, least of all yourself, in his presence as the object of your ultimate devotion. I didn't mention this last time, but I will say that there is no sin in loving yourself, but there is a sin in hating yourself. And when you make yourself an object of worship alongside of God, you hate yourself, and you are destroying yourself. So selfishness is self-destructive. If you have a true love of self, you certainly will not make yourself a rival deity to God. Now, in the second commandment, we're told about the object of worship, I mean the method of worship, and not the object of worship. It's understood from the first commandment that God alone, no other gods in your presence, is the object of your worship. And now when it comes into this much lengthier statement, which uh, again you'll notice is negative in its formulation, he's telling you how not to go about worshiping the one and only God. See to it that you have the proper object. No other deity in the divine presence. Now, with respect to the way you should worship, you'll not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of that of what is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath and the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers, and so on. It commands Israel not to worship or serve images. Now see that this means in worship, in spite of this kind of phraseology here, is because it's already indicated that you'd have no other gods in God's presence. Idolatry would, of course, be an objective uh, disobedience of the first commandment. You would actually be creating something in the presence of the deity, which actually would take, as we noticed the last time, a supersedence over the deity. Well, that's established, God only. And now you're talking about the way you should worship him, and here you're told that you shouldn't actually have uh, these uh, images or serve them at all. It will not do to say that this second commandment forbids worship of images as gods. False gods were forbidden in the first commandment. Images and worship of, tr of the true God are forbidden here. Be the only way by which you could account for it. Some translations are clearer than the NASV here. The way the NASV reads, you would think it is actually a continuation of the first commandment. But as I say, you're already in the sphere of another area altogether. God is not only concerned that he be worshipped, but the way he is worshipped also concerns the deity. And we know from the history of, uh, of worship that these images are used supposedly and professedly in the worship of the true God that become, however, objects of worship themselves. Now, number four, those who bow to images claim it is for worship of what is beyond the image, but he who is beyond the image forbids men to worship him uh, by images. This is a thing we have to recognize about idolatry, going back to the word itself. It's literally a worship 
of the image, but I don't think there has ever been an idolater in the history of the world who worships the idol or claims to worship the idol. The totem pole is always referring to something beyond the totems which are before you. The image is always representing something beyond the image. I don't think in the history of what we call idolatry anybody has ever admitted literally to worshiping the image. As I said last time, it's almost idiotic for the creature to make a creature which he elevates above himself. Paul points out the idiocy of that in, in Acts 17. You see, you can't be that stupid as not to know that you have created this entity. Now, if you're going to bow down and worship it, you're worshiping something which is even below yourself, the product of your own ingenuity or skill, as the case may be. So invariably, when you find primitive peoples doing that, they are usually animists, who worship the animus or soul behind the things and not the things themselves. And the most primitive kind of people, there are millions of such still uh, seemingly worshiping idols. But when you uh, talk with them or discuss with them, you find there's high gods among low peoples beyond these seemingly superstition, superstitious items which they have made with their own uh, hands. What I'm saying at this particular point is idolatry always points to some deity or some transcendent spirit or some omnipresent mind or something like that beyond the image, and the image is itself never the object of worship. It's always pointing uh, uh, beyond it. That is always the excuse for idolatry in or out of the Christian church, and that's what God is forbidding here in this second commandment. Number five, to look historically at the situation in the Christian church. Roman Catholicism, uh, if you consider Roman Catholicism as, as existing in the eighth century, I think I mentioned to you before that the fall of Rome really took place in the uh, 16th uh, century, and Roman Catholicism as we know it now was born out of the Reformation as a reaction to it. The church of the 8th century was a, an evangelical church which was beginning to accumulate various and sundry erroneous ideas, including this one which was formulated at the Second Council of Nicaea in A.D. 786. It together, uh, the Western church together with the Eastern Orthodoxy at that time, on the basis of that Second Council of Nicaea, began to use images in worship. Now, I'm pointing out what was a part of their thinking and still is. One, they admit they use images in worship. The East tends to use icons, which are bas-reliefs rather than uh, independent standing images, but they are still uh, representations of some being or another. They admit that. They don't deny it. They don't challenge it. I'm not alleging something that would be contested by those to whom I'm making the allegations. Two, they insist that they do not worship the images. I have never met a Christian anywhere who would plead guilty to worshiping his icon or images. I've been in churches in the East, for example, where I've watched a service where a man at the uh, priest is reading the Bible, and you could see people lolling around and stretching out and even sleeping, uh, utterly uninterested, and suddenly an icon is marched down the aisle. Everybody comes alive and flocks over to it and frequently bestow uh, kisses on it, but they insist that they do not worship the images. If you were an unsophisticated observer, unaware of that, you would certainly think, judging from their behavior in these services, that they do worship the images. That's what they're waiting for. They more or less uh, weariedly listening to the reading of Scripture and prayers and such things as that. But when that image comes in view, they're all alive, and they're all rushing toward it and bestowing some sort of obeisance upon it. But still, they will insist in the East and in the Roman Church as well, they do not worship the image. Three, they insist also that they do worship God and only God. And four, this is the main point here, 
but God forbids such worship. Let me go over that again. They admit they use images in worship. Two, they insist they do not worship the images. Three, they insist they do worship only God. Four, but God forbids such worship. Now, this is a significant thing. Uh, obviously, you can say that uh, this image is just a means by which uh, I, the worshiper, direct myself to God or a saint or someone like that. You can say that, but if you are saying that you worship God by means of this image and he forbids you to worship him by that means of image, uh, the means of that image, it won't do for you to say you do it because you'd be in open defiance of God. And manifestly, he's not going to accept a worship from you when he forbids you to worship in that way. This is extremely obvious, I know, and I feel as if I'm certainly insulting your intelligence when I mention it, but at the same time, this is constantly said by those who use images, east and west, in or out of the Christian church. They are directing it toward the being beyond, and in the case of the Christian church, they are worshiping the true God by means of these uh, particular images. All right, suppose you say that. That sounds reasonable. You're clearing yourself of idolatry, saying, I don't worship the image. I worship God by means of the image. See, all that sounds feasible and sensible and possible. We'd have to accept, your, accept it on your word and so on. But when you listen to the word of God and he says, I don't care to be worshiped that way, thou shalt not worship me with images and bow down before any likeness of anything in heaven or above or the earth beneath and so on, then you know full well that's a very presumptuous thing for you to say. You are worshiping him that way when he says you dare not worship me that way. That's almost worse than idolatry. But it becomes involved in idolatry in the sense that you are elevating yourself. See, as I say, it's always God versus you. I, this particular case, the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, under the advice of his teachers, but nevertheless, the individual as well, I choose to worship you this way. The fact that you don't choose to be worshiped that way, notwithstanding. Well, who's the deity here? The I or the God? Well, obviously the eyes have it because the eyes are doing what they choose to do in spite of the protest of the one whom they profess to worship thereby. Six, Eastern Orthodoxy, in the person of their great theologian John of Damascus, developed a unique argument for justifying the use of created icons in worship. John observed that God the Son took a created human nature. So he argued, John argued, when Christians wor <coughs> worship Christ, they worship the creature, his humanity, with which he is personally united. Now, before I give the response to that, let's make sure we get it, because this is, uh, this is far beyond the standard defense of the use of images in uh, worship. This is a justifying of the use of images in worship by the very worship of Jesus Christ. This is what makes it seemingly such a very potent and irresistible argument. Here is John who defended the use of icons, but he also gave an argument which he felt would establish the legitimacy of worshiping by means of a creature such as had never been heard of before. And that was this, which we all agree, that the divine Son of God took upon himself a human nature. Jesus Christ was the God-man. It's a sound orthodoxy. Remember our studies on the incarnation and so on. Jesus Christ is the theanthropic person, a hypostatic union. He's the God-man, permanently in union with human nature, never ever again to live as God alone, but to live as the God-man forever. Point number one, John was orthodox with respect to his Christology. He's teaching what the Bible teaches and what the whole church has recognized down through the ages to this day. Now he's saying something which is equally indisputable, namely that we worship Jesus Christ. We certainly do. It was a liberal who gave a sermon on the peril of worshiping Jesus. We say the peril is in not worshiping Jesus. We do worship Jesus Christ. All right. So we agree that Jesus Christ is the God-man. We agree that we worship the God-man. Now comes the argument of, uh, of uh, John of Damascus. We worship the man, Christ Jesus. 
and the man is a creature. He's a perfect creature, but he's a creature just as you and I actually are. If you can worship this creature, you can worship God through this creature, you can worship that particular creature also as well. Our fundamental objection to this type of thing is there's a worship of the image or a worship of the image because you create that image as your vehicle even when forbidden by God. And John, the ba John of Damascus is virtually saying, if you don't worship Jesus Christ, you're no Christian, and if you do worship Jesus Christ, you're worshiping a man because Jesus Christ is a man. Now, our answer to that, as I spelled it out in the paper, I won't read it here, uh, there, you can read it, but I, I'll express it here. He is the God-man, that is perfectly true. His deity is never separated from his humanity. When you worship God, you're worshiping a God who is also a man. But the worshiper directs his worship to the deity and not to the humanity. When we worship Jesus Christ, we do not worship the man Jesus. We do not worship him as a human being. We worship him because he is a divine being. If he came in his incarnate glory, in this, we would kneel. But it would be idolatry if we were kneeling to the glorified humanity of Jesus Christ. We would be kneeling to Jesus Christ because that is no mere man. He is in union with man, and it's his manhood which is visible to us, which we see, but it's because what we do not see, namely his deity is inextricably united with that humanity, that we bow our knee, not because of his humanity. And I'd say to John of Damascus or any of you who would think as he does there, if you worship the man, Christ Jesus, you are an idolater, you are violating the very commandments of God, one and two. And John of Damascus, I hope in the world to which he's gone, heaven, I think, hope he realizes that now, as I think he does, as he worships, I think surely he loved Jesus Christ and worshiped Jesus Christ, but was mistaken in the way in which he thought he could worship the human nature of Jesus and justified that as a ground for using his own icons. Number seven, another part to this uh, very long uh, commandment which we have here is this. God is a jealous God. The commandment uh, mentions there that uh, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This raises a great many problems with many people. One of the famous uh, Hebrew philosophers of our time, Martin Buber, insists that uh, the word really means zealous. I am a zealous God. He's uncomfortable with the idea of God being jealous. Uh, how can God be jealous of anything? Of course, we all immediately uh, think of that. But I'm explaining here, one, the church is his bride or wife. That language is used throughout the Old and New Testament that God's people are so united to God, veritably a wife and a husband relationship, even though it's in a divine and human transcendent uh, region. Uh, but at the same time, there is that intimacy and closeness that transcends the intimacy and closeness of man and wife who become one flesh. As a matter of fact, the argument of Paul in Ephesians 5 is that God created the institution of human marriage in which one man and one woman become one flesh primarily to illustrate the intimacy of the union between Jesus Christ and his church. It's a spiritual union, of course, and not a bodily union at all, as is marriage involves bodily and spiritual union. This union with Christ is strictly a spiritual union but it is so intimate and inseparable that he actually created the human marriage institution just to give us a dim illustration of the intimacy of the church with uh, Jesus Christ. Now, the church is his bride or uh, a wife, too. She may not leave him and marry the world. She's left the world. We've turned away from the world. We've given ourselves over to Jesus Christ. We're devoted to him completely, come what may. And three, if she does actually uh, uh, marry the world, he will divorce and reject her forever. I mean, that's the figure of speech. It's a figure of speech, but it's, uh, it's literally suggestive of a relationship between Christ and his church. It's very much like a marriage. 
When people come into the church, they profess faith in Jesus Christ. They profess to be his bride, a member of his body. Now, if later on they show by their love for the world and the flesh and the devil that they never have really been united with him, then the external divorce is over. I mean, marriage is over. They're divorced. It's an apostate church. He has nothing more to do with it. In that sense of the word, you see, there's, there's no jealousy. You understand what the problem is. God isn't jealous. How can he be jealous of anything? We talk about the man who has everything or the woman who has it. No human being ever has everything. No human being ever has anything. God has everything. Here is the being who has everything. How in the world can he be jealous of anything? Of course he can't be. It's just a way of expressing, as we say, anthropomorphically, We've seen this time and again. It's very important that God does, in order to be able to understand, be understood by many, expresses himself in the way, in the form of man, and like a jealous husband, a person who has everything, for example, can't depend on anything, can't lose anything, can't be added anything to his being, and so on. Being jealous makes no sense at all in absolute terms. But in the sense in which it's being used, it has brought home to us very poignantly and unforgettably how close and devoted our union with Christ must be. He is so insistent upon that that if we want to go back to Egypt, if we want to return to the world, he cuts us off forever. We are no longer his bride, his wife. He has nothing more to do with it. Of course, that reveals we never had a true union with him, but we did have an external union, and what is intimated here, even that will be dissolved. In the land where John of Damascus, for example, used to write his uh, summa, his theology and so on, his dogma and all, that land is almost totally out of the hands of Christians now. It's one perverse form of Christianity or another is about all you can ever find over there. God has divorced that branch of the church almost completely because of its turning away from him. It's just the way a, a jealous husband would do with a wife who insists on as number eight. God is jealous just as a human husband will not permit his wife to become a whore. So God will not permit his church to go a whoring. And that expression is time and again in the prophets, as you know. Adulterous Israel. Israel going a whoring. And Gomer, a classic illustration of it, who is, not, who is married to Hosea the prophet, you remember, God will not put up with that. Neither will a man. It's an interesting thing that situation has so changed today that I almost have to take some precious time here to mention the fact that husbands ought not to put up with that. Husbands are putting up with that, and wives are putting up with that time and again in our culture today. And Christian husbands and wives. I read in these gossip columns and so on about so-and-so, and they write to these advisors or counsel, what do I do with a philandering husband who's also an officer in the church, very popular and highly esteemed as a Christian? And usually the advisor will tell her how to handle the situation, not to be too disturbed by it, tell the man to tone it down, improve his ways, be a little less obvious, and such things as that. It's kind of carnal advice, and so uh, now you find it necessary. See, in the days in which the book, book was written, it was understood that a husband or a wife is not going to, especially a husband where in, the, in the more patriarchal society, a husband not going to put up with that sort of thing. Well, if even a human husband wouldn't allow his wife to become a whore, a tramp, living philanderously any particular way she wanted and so on, you don't suppose God is going to allow that with his church. Obviously, he can't. And when you do worship him in a way that is not of his appointing, you are obviously going the way of the world and the flesh and the devil, doing what you please to do. He's not going to put up with it. He's a jealous God. He wants you to worship him only and worship him the way in which he is worshipped. And otherwise, he will dispatch with you as seemingly jealous as if he really was losing something, when as a matter of fact, you're losing everything. Number nine, God is jealous for the church's good, not for his own which is unlosable and perfect. And here's where I always appreciate Somerset Maugham's story. Uh, what was it called? Razor's Edge. They, I always think of it as a story about Larry, because Larry, as the book opens, Larry's in the corner reading William James's psychology while all his friends are having a, 
so, I don't know, some sort of a dance, some sort of a ball, a gay time, everybody's happy and having fun. And here's this young fellow buried in a heavy psychological tome. Well, he's a man who's on the search for the ultimate and for the true, and so he goes, among other places in his search, to a monastery in Germany, I believe, somewhere in Europe at any rate, and there he learns that the God of Christianity is a jealous God. And he insists that all things were made for his glory. And this simply puts uh, Larry off. As he said, any man who behaves that way is an egotist, and I tend to despise him. And you're virtually telling me that the God of heaven and earth is a cosmic egotist? And as the story goes on, he turned his back on Christianity, and he ultimately got lost in the morasses of Eastern pantheism, if you remember the story. But what turned him off was the idea that God was a jealous God, a selfish God, a cosmic egotist. But Larry missed the whole point. It's only for your sake that God's a jealous God. He can't lose anything. You turn away from him and you lose everything. He will cut you off, but will suffer nothing in the process. If you're cut off, you'll be damned. It's for your sake, therefore, that he's a, a jealous God, not for his sake. He's no egotist in the sense of wanting everything just to praise him. He couldn't live without it. On the contrary, he lives in and of himself sufficiently and perfectly from all eternity. His jealousy, in other words, my friend, I hope you understand, as Larry didn't understand, is not for his sake, but for your sake. Finally, God will keep punishing as long as Israel keeps sinning, but mercy comes to thousands of her children who stop sinning and start loving and obeying God. I'm referring there to the last part of this statement, which I think I can just mention now. We will have to take a moment in the next lecture with it, but let me get it before you here. He's a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandment. People are especially troubled by that, visiting the iniquity of the third and the fourth generation, and how that harmonizes with the other statement, but we'll take a glance at that before we turn to commandment number three in the next lecture.